So today we're taking a look at this $10 GPS tracker that I built from scratch and how it uses a flaw in open Wi-Fi networks to remain stealthy. So a couple months ago, I shot a video with some friends from Hack5 where we tried different hacking products and off-the-shelf devices to test some ways that a creep might track you. So unfortunately, that video got taken down and I don't have much of the original B-roll, but in this video, I cut together the clips that I do have and I wanna talk about the results of that experiment as well as how I designed this stealthy GPS tracker around a $3 Wi-Fi microcontroller. So for a little bit of a background, the target of our experiment was our friend Irish. And my first friend used a drone and some wireless reconnaissance techniques to target Irish's phone in a predetermined boundary, while my second friend opted for off-the-shelf solutions like air tags and tile trackers and this GPS unit that we physically planted on him. Now, since I specialize in creating hardware prototypes and also think signals intelligence is really cool, what I ended up creating was a mix of both, and I designed this cheap disposable payload that I slapped on my friend's car, which uses open Wi-Fi networks as a way to provide location updates. So let's take a look at this first clip and see how I designed this payload. So I made this 3D printed GPS tracker prototype, and while it's not the most covert or discrete form factor, it does look kind of cool, but the way the Wi-Fi tracking mechanism works is actually kind of novel. So if we take a look at the components that are inside of this device, you'll see that we have a GPS module, a $2 Wi-Fi microcontroller called the ESP8266, a battery, and also this vibration sensor. You'll notice that there's no micro SD card for storing GPS data or an LTE module for remote communication. But using a new word driving technique that I call DNS drive-by, this device can automatically connect to any open Wi-Fi network it sees while Irish is driving through the city. And it takes just a couple seconds to send me all his cached geolocation and date-time information, so I can basically see anywhere that he's been. If you've ever connected to a Starbucks Wi-Fi or any other open Wi-Fi network, you might notice that a captive portal pops up, which doesn't allow you to access the internet until you basically have to click through a whole bunch of stuff. However, many of these open networks have incomplete firewall rules, which allow DNS requests to pass through. And this would basically allow me to pass any arbitrary text directly through the firewall. In my case, I'm encoding the GPS data as a subdomain in my DNS request. So every time this connects to an open Wi-Fi network, it'll run through its internal memory and upload every logged coordinate to a domain that I'm in control of. At a $10 build cost using off-the-shelf components, not only does this technique make it pretty cheap to have semi-real-time location data, but it's also harder to reverse or track down since we're using open Wi-Fi networks instead of a SIM card for persistent communication. So with Irish's consent, I planted the tracker on his car and we set a predetermined zone in the city of Glendale where he could drive around the next day. So this is the part of the video where I want to disclaim that certain parts of this experiment were exaggerated, but also that this video is created for educational purposes only. So don't try to do any weird creeper shit with the tools and techniques that I'm about to show you, because they're not going to demonstrate how to do anything nefarious. But with that, just absorb this video as an educational experience about an interesting flaw in Wi-Fi security. So anyways, since my device is just a dormant implant that I don't really need to touch, I drove around with my other friend to help him perform active reconnaissance on Irish, and also shoot some clips throughout the day. So for his part of the experiment, I actually built a microcontroller rig that he strapped to the bottom of his DJI, which would let us sniff for unique Wi-Fi frames coming from Irish's phone. And after determining his rough whereabouts from the air, we used a Hack5 Wi-Fi coconut on the ground to fox hunt his precise location. Meanwhile, our other friend Michael was kicking back easy with the air tags and tile tracker and GPS units that we planted on Irish, but interestingly enough, we discovered that the air tags actually had the worst performance, even though Irish spent a lot of time in a pretty dense area at the mall. Unsurprisingly though, the GPS tracker was providing the most consistent updates since it was using LTE, but the trade-off that comes with using this device is how conspicuous it is to plant, and also the fact that the unique ID and SIM card could make it traceable if discovered. So checking back in on my device, one of the first limitations I actually ran up against was a flaw in the wake-up mechanism I designed, which just connected a shake sensor between the reset pin and ground. So this was basically just triggering constant resets as Irish was driving, and while I fixed this retroactively, I just had to disable this mechanism entirely while we were testing it out. So now would be a great time to note that I'm actually working on these DNS drive-by kits that you can pick up on my website over at lindlabs.io if you're interested in building your own. And also that these beautiful PCBs and video was sponsored by my friends over at PCBWay. So if you're looking for PCB fabrication, 3D printing, machining services, and a variety of other turnkey solutions, make sure you check out their website over at pcbway.com for more information. 
So anyways, with that, let's check out this last clip that I got after tracking Iris down to the Glendale Galleria. So I'm out here at the Galleria. I was following Iris around for the first half of today, but now that my friend David took over shooting, I'm gonna check in on the GPS tracker and see if we were able to get any hits from Irish. So the basic way the tracker works is the device is gonna be automatically scanning for the presence of open Wi-Fi networks and attempt to authenticate to them. Now, if that's successful, what it will do is encode all of the GPS and daytime information as a base 32 string and fire this off as a DNS request to a server that I'm in control of. Now, since that's a lot of overhead to get set up, I'm using a free online service called Canary Tokens in order to manage those DNS requests and also so that way I don't have to set up my own server from scratch. So let's take a look at what that looks like. You can see that we have hits from the GPS tracker on Irish's car that contain the decoded GPS and daytime information. But since this is a lot to go through manually, I created a simple Python script that lets us extract that data as a clean CSV file that I can open up in Google Maps. Now, after running my script, all I have to do is just import the CSV file over to mymaps.google.com, select the latitude and longitude fields, and then plot the daytime information. So as you can see here, this gives us all the GPS data that has been logged from Irish's trip. And it looks like the last entry was just a little over 10 minutes ago after he passed through the Galleria. So as you can see, we got some pretty recent updates from Irish. And so far, this is pretty successful, likely due to the fact that we're in a pretty dense area that has a lot of open Wi-Fi networks from coffee shops and other things like that. So for context, I actually swapped places with our cameraman for part of the video to tag along with Irish when he visited Forest Lawn. And then we swapped places again after that, and I helped my friend Wardrive and gather aerial reconnaissance on Irish up the street at the Glendale Galleria. So you can see from the map that I constructed using the Canary Tokens DNS hits that I was able to prove my tracker works where you can see Irish's location at both places. However, a small limitation that I discovered in my recent video is that the Canary Tokens dashboard actually has a data cap at 50 entries. So luckily in the short duration of a couple minutes it took Irish to drive between these two places, I was still able to map his route from these two main spots that he hit that day. So at the end of the day, I was still able to prove that this DNS drive-by technique works, and what's most important to me is making this research accessible and fun to replicate. So if you don't have access to fancier tools or can't build a committed war driving rig, you can still follow along with this project for around $10 and see for yourself how easy it is to use open Wi-Fi networks for data exfiltration. If you enjoyed this video and want to help support my future research, you can check out my donation link and products like the Nugget over at lindlabs.io and stay posted on the channel for upcoming videos like war driving with DNS drive-by and other cool hacking topics. I'm Alex Lind and thank you for watching Lind Labs.